Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. And thank you for joining us for our webinar, The Inextricable Link Between Value Streams and Resource Capacity Planning. Our presenters today are guest speaker, Forrester Vice President and Principal Analyst, Margot Visitacion, TASTOP President and COO, Neil Chosky, and TASTOP Strategic Transformation Advisor, Danny Preston. Thank you very much. And welcome everyone to our uh, conversation today. Uh, Neil and Danny have invited me to uh, have a conversation about the inextricable link between resource management, that delivering on value streams, and how organizations can work together more effectively. And really, when you think about it, <clears throat> being able to deliver value is all about keeping up with the speed of business and understanding how to optimize the way your teams, product teams, uh, and delivery teams work together in order to deliver the highest level of value um, in within the optimum time frame. So, how do organizations need to keep up with business and keep up with the speed of business? Well, we have to look at things a bit differently than what we have in the past. What organizations have recognized is one of the reasons why um, companies have adopted Agile and now have expanded that delivery practice to focus more on not just delivering working software faster, but delivering leveraging practices like value stream management to deliver better outcomes and better value faster to their customers is because they recognize that the traditional ways of delivering software was not effective. Why? Because resource models in traditional organizations don't work. They're siloed by nature. You have leadership, lines of business, the C-level, and underneath of those leaders, you have functional teams, business teams, business analysts, developers, quality assurance, enterprise architecture, operations and infrastructure, um, and overlay functions that have to be shared across all of them. That does not create a nimble and effective way of delivering business um, and delivering better business outcomes. Why? Because functional teams rely on utilization. When you think about a project team, I was just having a conversation with a client of mine this morning that, and we were talking about this very subject. You have a project team that's formed when the demand gets approved. You bring the team together. They don't work together on a daily basis, but they're brought together for the length of a project. So you have ramp up time. You also have shared resources that cannot be dedicated on a full-time basis to the project team for the length of the project. So you're looking at utilizing availability wherever you possibly can. And what does that do? That then magnifies the walls or thickens the walls of the silos because it takes time to get up and get running. Margo, I was gonna just add to that. It's not just the shared services, shared resources. You have outsourced resources. You have you know, heavyweight or anachronistic uh, processes in the different silos. Um, exactly. You have open source tools even that in a lot of cases, you have tools that each, each uh, silo is using that doesn't even talk to the others. So you almost feel bad for people trying to do capacity planning because this much complexity makes it almost an impossible job. You make a great point. It's not just people silos, but it's also technology silos. And that just adds an additional level of complexity on, um, on a team. And at the end of the day, especially if you're sharing resources, you're sharing um, uh, tools, you know, that are not necessarily familiar across the board, or you require skill sets that are um, specialized and not resident in your organization. Traditionally, organizations fell back on utilization. And utilization is a fallacy. No matter when it comes to people, utilization is an absolute fallacy. When you're doing capacity planning, you're hopefully planning for a 100% planned allocation for any, uh, any activity that you are 
um, that you're uh, assigning a resource. And if you don't, and if your project management maturity is not um, at, at, a, at a given level that allows you to recognize utilization fallacies, what happens is that planned allocation is reduced automatically by 50% because a resource, especially a shared or a contracted resource is only available a portion of the time. And then when you shoe in unplanned work, that actual real utilization drops down. So for traditional project delivery, you're dealing with maybe a quarter of the absolute availability that you can hope to get for a resource. Bottlenecks in waterfall, the only positive thing we can say about this is bottlenecks in waterfall become apparent pretty quickly when you are sharing resources. So not only are you waiting till the end of delivery to receive value, you're actually extending that wait time because you're creating bottlenecks by having resources that can't be dedicated or it takes too long to identify when you need a skill to bring the skill into the mix. To combat that organizations, you know, about 20 years ago, we started uh, uh, forming using agile approaches and, and techniques so that you went from that pool of resources to um, having integrated modular team, uh, modular integrated product teams where you broke down the silos and you had the teams work together. You broke down the wall of delivering technology by having a product owner um, actively involved in the, um, in the, um, in the uh, process. So that should resolve all of the problems, right? Not exactly. You still have the, the problems that we talked about before, shared resources, sourcing problems, and inconsistent use of technology. And the, because the reality of the world is that product teams rely on a broader operating model. You have the integrated teams that are working together. They're dedicated to a product. They are embedded with that product. Unfortunately, most organizations are in a state of transformation. They're still leveraging PMOs. They still have a need for resource management, what we're here to talk about today. There's still challenges around budgeting. How do you share resources and how do you fund them? Um, and also you're looking at specialists that have to be shared across the board. Agile coaches, customer experience, user experience, security, architecture, all of these are the broader operating model that really support and enable software product teams. Still, agile adoption has expanded. It's now the, the really the majority of, of organizations that we've surveyed now have used agile in at least half, if not more of their software delivery um, approaches. And theoretically, the plan for agile looks great. You've got longstanding teams, they're allocated, they're time boxing their delivery. So you're seeing uh, value come uh, value being delivered faster and having the business reap that value faster. So it looks better on paper. But when you drill down, you really see that bottlenecks occur everywhere. Again, shared teams or required uh, specialized resources, they're not embedded with every team takes time to bring in um, or plan for a source, um, a, a sourcing partner to come in and get up to speed. So when you're looking at resource management at for an agile organization, you are seeing the um, constraints coming up, but they're not as readily ev evident where you're seeing them blocked at a higher level. Your teams, team one, two, through team four may be delivering on what they are chartered to do, you know, what's pulling from their backlog. But when you have a, a UX team, for example, of 
you know, four to five people servicing multiple product teams, they may be the ones that are going to be coming backed up because the demand on their capacity becomes too great. I mean, Neil, and I know you and I have talked about this a number of times. You know, what, what do you see in this area and, and you know, what are your customers asking you? No, for sure. We and we see this all the time, right? And it, it's it's funny that you bring up UX team as the as the example in this case, but it's almost always the UX team or the QA team. You know, even if they're embedded inside the inside the organization, right? Like an agile team, you know, like is recommending, you end up seeing these these individuals who are just ridiculously overallocated. So our customers end up playing, you know. What we see a lot in our customers is they have to play whack-a-mole. First, they have to even identify what the biggest bottleneck is. And then you start to address it, right? Maybe it's, hey, let's add another UX person because they're so overwhelmed that that's the, that's the bottleneck. Um, you know, maybe it's, it's, you know, automate something. Um, and then, you know, you again rerun your metrics to see, ah, did that address the actually address the bottleneck? And if it does you're now off to find the next big bottleneck and you play whack-a-mole again. So um, this is super common. And I think you hit it on the head that this, this move towards agile uh, has kind of hidden some of these challenges and problems. And, you know, as much as, you know, I think we all are happy we've moved on to, to more of an agile view, you're absolutely right. We've lost that visibility in many cases. Right. It, it hasn't solved the core problem of, get, of, of really allowing everyone in the organization to work at their, um, what I like to call prime capacity, their ability to deliver their best outcomes. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess just piling on that just a, just a little bit, but yeah, sure, the term agile transformation, you know, it implies there's, a, there's an end to it. You know, we've transformed at the end of our transformation. And I think what, what we're seeing there, what that previous slide expresses and kind of uh, uh, this slide as well, is it's, it's very much a journey of continuous improvement. There's never like we've finally arrived. It's, it's constantly chasing that next bottleneck through your system and figuring out how to optimize that. Then you find the next one. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. So how do we start tackling that? You know, let's start chatting about that. Well, value stream management as a practice is one is, is a significant step in helping to resolve that um, in, in helping to resolve that uh, that challenge because guidance from the business level value stream provides insight into what is important, what should we be delivering, and it also gives insight into what teams need to be working on the uh, delivering the right outcomes and delivering the appropriate value, what features, enablers, solutions need to be delivered. And, you know, value stream management as the control plane, you know, it tracks and it measures, visualizes the value stream. It identifies where there are, where there's waste, where there are bottlenecks and what, uh, and also the outcomes that are be being delivered. Are we getting the right outcomes out there at the right time? It also provides insight for a product team to see where their bottlenecks are. And, you know, VSM solutions help capture the data to help provide insights into that area. That's great for a product team. But what if you're managing a hundred product teams? How do you take that visibility that, that helps the individual product team be able to enable greater resource capacity management and resource optimization at the portfolio level. And what we're seeing now is organizations that, are, that have recognized this at a team level are now starting to drive this at a broader level by integrating portfolio management with value stream management. So from a strategic perspective, if we look at the left side of the screen, we're seeing that it provides a clearer understanding of of identifying what total cost is. Why? Because we're not just looking at the value stream of the delivery process, but we're actually linking business value streams to development value streams to get a total sense of what is the total amount of work done? What is the total cost of the work that needs to be done? 
And are we aligned with the work that we need to get done? And tactically, it creates better focus and it manages work in progress by pulling demand through the organization. The connection at the portfolio level allows you to have a broader view of perceived bottlenecks. So you're still building your plans, you're still identifying your budgets, you're looking at your portfolio roadmaps, but instead of just in uh, funding individual projects or a program or an individual project, we're now looking at how do we look at the value stream as a whole to understand what our total resource needs are and what our total value requirements are in order to be able to deliver more effectively. So that as you were performing the proactive part of capacity planning, <clears throat> excuse me, identifying what are the shared services that I need? What are the sourcing services that I need? You're bringing everyone together in a big room environment, whether it's physical or virtual, and you're identifying what, what you need and you're staking out your capacity planning requirements at a higher level. Portfolios give you the insight into what is available and VSM gives you the insight into what's actually available. So plan demand versus actual demand. And Margo, I think I love that idea of the VSM control plane and the VSM data plane, right? And, and one of the things that we've seen with a lot of our customers is that the control plane is only effective if the data plane is actually capturing end-to-end -end metrics. So many organizations and agencies are kind of lulled into this false sense of confidence, um, but they're only capturing CI/CD data. And exactly. that is, uh, gives this completely distorted view of reality. Right, Flow, or they're only capturing the top-down planning data so they know what's requested, yep. but they don't know how well that's actually being used. That's exactly right. So for real improvement for flow, it's all about the end to end from ideation to customer delivery. And that is at a value stream level all the way up to a portfolio level. Exactly. So when you're relating um, business value to VSM, essentially what we are saying here is that organizations are moving away from you know, from, a, from a, um, an approach model, they're moving from project-based to product-based. But from a planning model, they're also moving from annual operating budgets that are predicated upon projects to identifying value streams such as, and these are business value streams, lead to close, account servicing, supply chain. And what that then tells you is what are the business value stream tells you that uh, about the end-to-end -end set of activities that are required to deliver value to a customer. So you're cutting your lead time from the time a, a customer applies, from, applies for a mortgage on their mobile phone to the time that they get an approval and you're actually closing the loan. So that can be lead to close. Um, the value stream identifies all of those critical steps and also identifies the waste and the bottlenecks. It's the same as a development value stream, but you're looking at it at the higher business process there. The business value stream also identifies which capabilities, applications, and platforms need to be created or modified. That's important when you get to resource management because value stream management at a development level identifies the end-to-end -end set of activities and the skills needed to help deliver that value at a product level. So when you are relating business value to value stream management and you're leveraging a view of all of the resources that you need, you can then begin to identify where there will be potential feedback. And then as Neilan mentioned, you leverage that data to identify what the real delivery is and that can help you by reviewing this on a regular cadence with those feedback loops to find how you are effectively delivering value. You may find that the end-to-end -end flow of work, the efficiency 
The demand is too high for the actual capacity you have in order to manage effective work and progress limits. That gives you insight into better sourcing going forward. Neilan, do you have anything to add here? No, I think you've I think you've hit a lot of the aspects, and we're going to dive into this. I think as okay. Danny and I cool. talk a lot more, so I think you're you're right there. Okay, <laughs> then I'll wrap it up here. Okay, <laughs> so we'll talk. So you know, at the end of the day, what you want to do is align goals, value, and delivery. So your business strategy informs your strategic roadmaps. That tells you what epics and uh, I'm sorry, that tells you what technologies you're going to be investing in. And the strategic portfolio just provides the guidance of here's our total capacity, here's what our investment streams are, and then that enables the teams to identify leveraging VSM capabilities, what goes into the product, the plan flow for delivery of that uh, capability, and what VSM does so well in you know, measuring and capturing that flow identifies where resources may be the challenge for creating those roadblocks. I think this slide does such a good job of highlighting what I think we see every day at Task Up with our customers, which is demand is probably the last thing that's really well understood yes, by absolutely. people who are doing the capacity planning. And the more you can kind of get this closed loop, get this, um, which I know you're going to talk about soon, but get this closed loop, the better the planning activity happens and the better that the, the demand is informing that. And it, it just becomes a virtuous cycle. Absolutely, I agree. And you're, you're right. The capacity planning is done generally a couple of levels above the product teams themselves, you know, at a, on the annual basis or, or uh, maybe biannual basis. But the teams are the ones that need to inform the actual consumption of capacity to know that you're on track for your capacity planning. So you need the feedback loops in order to make smarter decisions. That's what this is all about, is better decision making. Because it gives you insight into dependent work and identifying where you need to either sequence, identify dependencies so that you get visualization into those over allocated teams or maybe a, a specific resource, a shared entity like data or security. Um, better coordinate cross team activities, work stream activities. Um, it provides guidance into how do I sequence work if I can't get UX involved during you know, sprint two, maybe I can hold off to, to sprint three in order to get their feedback on a change. Um, it also provides better for, uh, insight into how you are going to analyze and report and make decisions based upon performance measures and velocity. And what it looks like is, you know, the fact is you do need a macro level view. And what I'm seeing in talking to my customers is that portfolio offices or no, or PMOs, if you still call them that, they're actually pulling in really anxious for data from VSM in order to help them make better planning decisions and work through dependencies for allocating resources. So, you know, as you're making your transformation, you know, initially we saw a lot of PMOs being disbanded, but as agile scales, you recognize that you need that macro level view. It might be a virtual office now, but they are they need that data at the control plane level to help them make better portfolio level decisions. Because at the end of the day, planning, that top-down planning is still holistic, but it informs decentralized decision-making so that you are better servicing your customers. In close, what you recognize is the, the benefits of Agile and benefit of value stream management is it allows for tighter stakeholder alignment between Epic teams or product teams and their stakeholders. It allows them to have that just in time conversation with executives and the and and in order to refine backlogs and identify what is the most valuable for customers at the product level but having that information fed into the portfolio 
enables your portfolio uh, managers to work with all of the shared services organizations or the sourcing organizations or even architecture to identify tools that are being used to remove the dependencies and help teams work more effectively. Okay, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Neilan and to Danny. Well, Margaret, if you uh, spot things that you're hearing as we were chatting, please dive in. We, we want Absolutely. to make as conversational as possible, but we will dive in with a couple of slides and then share some real world examples here. So. All right, so one of the, the first points I wanna make here is, and, and really riffing off of Margo's material, these dependency concerns are even greater when you realize that your value streams are a network and your org charts, regardless of whether you're waterfall or you are even fairly agile, aren't the only determinant about what's going on. We talked a little bit about shared services, um, outsourced resources can come from anywhere, um, open source and, and technology is kind of flowing in um, that, that isn't even part of what you built. And, and all of this is to deliver on these business outcomes. And networks are super hard to manage when, when you have all of this complexity. But there is a better way. Instead of, like imagine a world where your capacity isn't determined by organizational lines, but rather outcome lines. Um, i.e. value streams. This is the key point. You can kind of look across the silos, look across the, the firewalls, um, look across the, the into the shared teams and really plug into the source systems and see what's really happening. So I'm gonna hand it off here to Danny um, to show you kind of what this looks like in the real world. But imagining that world where it's not determined by your organizational lines, but much more the data and the information end to end that's available. Yeah, and, and yeah, let me just pile on that slide real quick um, before we jump into looking at how you could actually visualize it. But I think there's some people watching this that may say, look, hold on, I thought, I thought product value stream solved all this. Like, don't we have everybody on the product value stream that we need to deliver that? Like we've read the book, that's the way it's supposed to happen, right? But the reality I think the, that Margo brings out really well is that it's, it's, there's always a crack somewhere in that. And as much as you try to encapsulate all those dependencies in one, one place, there's a dependency outside of that somewhere in 99.9% .9 of the orgs I've worked in. So instead of trying to get in on a, um, you know, building some sort of way to detect where the issue is, lack of, lack of resources or lack of um, automation, things like that, the, the idea I think that, that Viz really brings out as we, as we look at that is let's just look how things are flowing and where things are flowing. And regardless of cause, let's just see where the where the issues might be. And so, in Viz, you can you can model your flow regardless of source system. You know, if you're working in ServiceNow or Jira or uh, Agile uh, DevOps, whatever, you can um, you can model that and and start to see where things are actually flowing through your system. And and bigger than that, you just click down a level and you can actually see where flows piling up. So I started my career as a, an industrial engineer, so I was doing a lot of uh, you know, warehouse optimization, supply chain optimizations. And we didn't necessarily latch onto a cause, you know, like where, where is my conveyor belt too slow? We just looked for flow disruptions throughout the ecosystem. And that's where we went and we started to coach on that. Uh, and, and, you know, that's all lean world. And we all know in a lean world, like if you optimize anything but the bottleneck, you're not optimizing the right thing. Like you need to really focus on dealing with that bottleneck. So in this view here, we can look across all the different states, all the different teams in an org and start to visualize where's that, where's that big problem. So things higher on the list are, um, are, are actually more, more things impacted by that and things further to the right on this list will show you um, how long those things are waiting as, as compared to other things in the system. So, you know, real quickly, we can drill down and see, you know, this particular ecosystem, the team Bifrost is really the place where we need to go and, and spend some more time understanding what's holding them up. They're being held up significantly more than other teams in the ecosystem. So right there, we can jump deep into, into bottlenecks and see a little bit more of what's going on. All right, thanks, Danny. I think the key here is what we have to do is get visibility 
into the value stream network to identify the primary source of the bottlenecks or the inefficiencies so that you can start to take a data-driven approach, a systems approach really is what we're talking about here to continuous improvement. And that at the end of the day is the goal here. Um, all of this stuff that we're talking about here, and we actually were calling these chaos points, but are compounded by the simple fact that nowadays most of these teams have way too much work. What we're seeing when we, um, when we start with customers is that most value streams have 12 months of work in progress to, to complete before they can even start on a new project or a new initiative. Um, as soon as you're running these kinds of high utilization, you know, you're gonna suffer long flow times, you're gonna become unpredictable. It's essentially all you're doing is throwing more weight on a team that's already struggling to tread water. And that usually ends up in nothing good at the end of the day. But there is a better way. Instead of queuing up work, let's find areas that are struggling. Let's help them prioritize. Let's help them in other ways. Um, Automation has become a really big thing. Kind of some of the cloud environment stuff helps a lot. Sometimes it's just a resource capacity issue. Sometimes you can bring in consultants if it's a temporary issue. But this is, and then we have to consider canceling work. We have to consider reprioritizing mm -hmm. um, because piling more on just isn't the case. No, I mean, that's the reason why organizations were going to Agile in the first place was to manage and work with Work and work in progress limits, and I think what you're what you need to be looking at is initially, you know, re it, it may not have been technology resources, uh, meaning people, uh, product teams that were the bottleneck, but we're seeing bottlenecks across the entire organization. And I think you make it a really good point that sometimes it, it you know you have to differentiate between is it a tech resource meaning the technology that you're delivering, or is it a human resource? And when you can differentiate that, that drives a much more fruitful conversation between the decision makers. Yeah, I mean, I think we've all seen this, Margo, right? That, I mean, how often is it an approval process that is the delay in a lot of- Exactly. Stuff? So it exactly. ends up being a whole slew of different types of things. Security has to review something. There, there's so many different possibilities. And mm -hmm. that's why having that end-to-end, -end, not just technology, not just business overview of the value stream is so, so critical. Um, and that actually leads in perfectly, I think, to some of the examples that Danny's going to show. So he's going to dive into some examples of how the flow metrics provide insight into what capacity will free up. Yeah, so, and, and this is a common challenge across organizations, right? I was in a, in a sprint planning watching team uh, just last week, and I think they brought in 20 features into their sprint. This is a five-person team, so 20 features. Each feature had a, at least two stories on it, and so what that team is doing is they're just a mile wide and an inch deep. They're not really getting a, 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 a decent amount of progress across those 20 features, and you fractal that up, and you'll see organizations doing the same thing, where they're working on 100 epics uh, all simultaneously. So, with with this, we can actually plug in and show that happening. So we can we can look at our assembly plant for for code and begin to see is work piling up or is it not. So down here in flow load, I can see for this particular organization, it's just been steady, increasing, increasing, increasing. And we know there's a point where when your load becomes so much, you start to be able to deliver less, and it takes longer to deliver those things. Just like uh, you know back when we all commuted home during uh, you know busy rush hours, there's there's a very predictable time to commute at home, maybe over uh, you know one o'clock, two o'clock, but then at rush hour, it's unpredictable. You're overloading the the infrastructure, and so you'll see that in organizations. So here, you'll you'll see that impact where this this particular organization, the load is so high now that they've had a sharp decline in their ability to deliver uh, any kind of work, feature work, defect work, whatever it is. They're starting to get to that point of overloading. So if we can't see that, if this is all just stored in little stories at the team level and, and you know, scrum masters are kind of giving their uh, qualitative assessment of what's going on, you, it's hard to get executives to lean in and make those hard decisions and say, hey, we actually need to focus on this instead of that. But when you can visualize that for the, for the organization and see how it's infecting things like our velocity and our, our time, how long it takes to go from in, in started to finished, 
um, you're able to, to make a lot better decisions. And then on top of that, we can actually model and, and start to look at the impact on our system. So in this particular org, if we were able to take care of some of that feature whip and take it off, they would actually increase their time by seven and a half percent. And then we can zoom that out and start to look at our portfolio and say, hey, you know, of all the products, given what we've got, the current states of WIP, when are we actually gonna have capacity for new work? Like when are we actually gonna be able to get in and do that next really good idea? And so in this, this particular organization, it's distributed across here, some of them more than 33 months, you know, that's insane, right? How much WIP they have stored up. Um, but oftentimes, like Neilan mentioned, we see that in, in six to 12 months is pretty common as we look across here, you know, you've got that long before you can start something new and actually get it in, into a, a reasonable state of, uh, in process. So a lot of interesting insights when you can zoom out, look at the connected, connected systems and see where we, uh, where we actually want to focus our effort. Yeah, thanks, Danny. And one of the interesting things is, and, and it's, you know, we're starting to gather anecdotal evidence of this, but where we're seeing work in progress really starting to pile up and where the capacity overload is starting to hit, we're actually starting to see that it's happening much, much more at the feature level. And interestingly, across our customers, much less at a defect level. They're usually not overloaded at, and when they're trying to resolve defects. Now, the sad statement of that is, of course, feature work that delivers on strategic is what delivers on strategic plans. And it's, it's really what most leaders have to promise and what they have to deliver on. So the irony is that probably what is the most important thing to the organization and to customers um, is the thing that is where the overload is happening. Um, this actually leads right into um, kind of the, the next point. When you think of capacity planning, most folks, and, and Margo, I think you described it really, really well. It, capacity planning happens up here where there's a lot less understanding of, of the work and it, it's viewed as, demand is viewed as kind of rather monolithic um, uh, from a profile perspective. Um, I think all of us have been around long enough to know that debt, whether it's tech debt or other forms of debt, um, kind of ends up starting as it starts to grow and grow and grow. There's scenarios where that can overwhelm you and it, it starts to prevent your ability to deliver features um, I think in Danny's example earlier, he also showed that it was affecting the ability to even deliver on, on, on defect fixes and stuff like right. that. Mm -hmm. So you've got to find the right balance, not just of technical debt, but of all the flow metrics, of all of the types of work um, of, across all of these categories of work. So... Um, in the flow framework, which is, which is our kind of flavor of value stream management, mm -hmm. we call these categories flow items. Um, features are exactly what you would think they are. They're, they're you know, the things that are going to hopefully add more revenue or increase usage or, or retention. Um, defects are whether they're, they're identified by a customer or whether they're identified in your testing process or any other place, but they're bugs, essentially. Um, risks um, in, in today's world of GDPR and, and solar winds, which is, I'm based in Austin, so we use the solar winds example a lot. Uh, you have to constantly, constantly be making sure that you're delivering um, in a secure and compliant way. And then of course we talked about debt, but you have, to, you have to keep addressing debt so that you're able to deliver in the future. At the end of the day, distribution's a zero sum game. Right. In, you can be intentional about this and you can actually teach this muscle. And, and what we also see is that not all value streams, not all products should be treated the same. If you're earlier in your life cycle um, in the innovation and kind of growth stages, you, you're going to have higher feature distribution. You have fewer customers that are using it. So probably less defect work at that juncture. But once a product's live and it's been widely used, that's where defect work and debt start to play in. And then all the way to decline where maybe you don't want to invest as much um, from that perspective. So I, go for this it. is a great, this is a great um, uh, example of this. You know, as organizations are trying to scale, one of the things that they're now 
wrestling with is investment horizons, and that will dictate your capacity planning going forward. So by, be able, by being able to provide insight into where you should, you know, what is the appropriate level of flow makes for a far more um, effective strategic planning uh, exercise. So you know, this, is in, this is a perfect example of a feedback loop that drives stronger uh, strategic planning going forward. Yeah, no, and and I'll throw out a couple examples um, since you brought back the, you brought up the feedback loop. It's absolutely the case. Um, you know, if you've just done a feature slog because you know the business needed something added to get a particular deal, right? That's almost always the the most common example. You know, as a capacity planner, as as someone who's thinking about the future there's gonna be defects and there's gonna be tech debt to pay down coming up. Mm -hmm. um, plan for that. Um, equally, as organizations have introduced automation or automated QA or, or, or something along those lines, there's an opportunity there where you're gonna have some opportunity to add capacity for some interesting feature type work. So all of these things, this, this, this understanding at that next level down kind of can help inform all the way up to what you should be doing. Um, Danny's going to, I think, going to dive into even a few more examples here that will kind of help highlight this topic even more. Yeah, and just, you know, right before we pile into that, but the, the nature of that feedback loop, it's really, it's really powerful. I wish, I wish we'd had this, you know, years ago in active use. But the, um, if you just launch a new product, you know, and, it's in, and you think it's in that incubation stage with a lot of feature work, you know, maybe a little bit of defect, and you look at the distribution and it looks more like that, that fifth stage of the, the decline where you've got a little bit of feature work and a lot of defect work. Um, well, guess what? Even though you launched that new product, it's in a decline mode because that's your, your distribution. And it's time to get a wake up call and say, why are we working so much on, on defects? What's going on? Let's, let's begin to dig into that. So I wanna just take for an example, um, another, another kind of real world situation here. Um, this particular, Product value stream has, has had a, you know, many months of developing these kind of distribution metrics. And you can see their flow velocity, they were delivering pretty well and they started to decline uh, right in March. And by the time they got to April, they realized, hey, we're, we're in a decline and they've been in a steady decline since then. So realizing that decline, they took a look at their flow distribution over here. This is that chart Neelan was just showing, uh, putting a time sequence flow. And so in here, they were investing heavily in feature work um, and then, you know, a couple defects, a little bit of tech debt, is they started to notice that decline. They said, man, you know, we've really got to figure out what the root problem was. And they realized it was some, some issues that they needed to address around tech debt. So we have, you know, we've got to be able to get more feature work in the, uh, in the pipeline. So you can see April, they started to make more investments in that tech debt. And then bit by bit, you know, they didn't reap the benefit of that right in May. They were, you know, really de-risking some stuff as well there with the yellow bar. But by June, they're able to, to get the benefit of that and, and get more feature work into their pipeline. So you'll begin to kind of see that trend as you go and, and you can make projections about what you need to do, but then you also have a very fast feedback loop to see, did what we do, did that investment we make actually move the needle on, on anything of consequence? And so uh, as a result, you'll begin to see your flow time go down. So for feature work where in April, they were suffering under all that tech debt, it was a very high time, uh, many days to get something to market. And now, you know, as they made that investment, it's begun to come down. So you can trace that through your systems. And then bigger than that, you can zoom back and look at your entire portfolio. So this is more of a, a zoomed out portfolio view and see what is the health, you know, based on industry best practices and the stage of that product, how am I doing on my distribution? So this particular chart here is highlighting, hey, you know, for account services, looks like we're doing pretty good with, with feature work, but a little bit more defect work than we might want to have. Let's dig into that. Or you can, you know, scroll down and look at a, a couple of these others where maybe it's a whole lot of defect work here. The insights uh, shop is, is very much in the event lifecycle visibility, all defects. Like that one is in sharp decline, I would say, um, based on that. So from a portfolio management view, you can start to say, you know, what do I need to move the needle on? Which of my products are in a healthy state based on their life cycle, which ones are not, and where do we need to reallocate investment on that? You know, I think you make a great point there. I mean, it really does allow for more effective strategic planning. 
if you have, you know, when you look at the traditional way that organizations track this stuff, it was by timesheets and by cost. And that gave you no insight into the actual value that was being delivered and where, you know, your most important uh, uh, tool is your, are your people and how are you allocating them to doing the highest value of work? If you're only tracking timesheets, budgets, and schedules, you get no insight. But this provides you the appropriate context to allow you to make those decisions. And it really can depoliticize the uh, decision making process. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly right, Margo. And and I think what I'm going to do now, just because we're we're kind of uh, approaching, we've got about time for about 15 minutes of questions. Before I dive into that, I'm just going to do the Q and A with, and I've seen a fair number of questions come in through the chat window. But uh, I'm going to just um, while we're doing the Q and A, I'm going to leave this slide up because. Um, Domin Dominica de Grandis is one of the absolute experts. She's the author of Making Work Visible in a lot of these topics here. And, uh, and um, she is doing an executive roundtable at the end of the month where she'll be discussing things like capacity planning, making work visible, um, and then really talking through some of the constraint stuff that she probably understands as well as anyone. Um, so there's a registration link there at theflowframework.org. And with that, uh, Laurel, uh, if you, I know you've been curating the questions. Um, you want to, you want to start kind of hitting us up with them, please. Absolutely, um, and thank you, everyone. If you have more questions, please ask them in the Q and A box. Our first question is: What maturity level must your company or agile teams be in order to apply this method or rely on this information? Yeah, I mean, Danny, you see this a little bit more in the real world than I do, but um, what we've seen is it actually doesn't matter where you're at. The most important thing with value stream management is not your methodology of how you're doing things or the fact that your 50 teams do everything slightly differently. It's, it's starting to baseline where you are today and then going through that activity of learning to improve. Danny, I think you probably see this in the real world way more than I do. Yeah, absolutely. And so that's uh, earlier in the in the presentation, I mentioned um, agile transformation. I'm trying to think of a better word than transformation because it implies like there's a there's this end state and, and we're going to do an activity and then we'll be done with the activity. Um, all of this is just continuous improvement. That's the best way to think about uh, value stream management. And so there is no, I've got to get to this level before I start. It's kind of like, hey, let's just baseline where we're at, find that next improvement opportunity, make that improvement and carry on. Um, I think what it, what it brings to the table is it actually allows you to make it quite tangible. Because when the minute somebody hears process improvement or continuous improvement, you know, I talk to folks like this every day and their eyes glaze over because they don't, they don't, they see it as this big hairy monster and it really doesn't have to be. If the challenge is defects, spending too many time on too much time on defect, okay, focus on that. Define an outcome that hey, our defect, you know, we we're, we're releasing, you know, certain number of critical defects with every release. We want to cut that down by half over the next. Those are the sorts of things that are tangible. Why do you want to do that? Because by the time it's, uh, it takes us to find a defect and resolve the defect we've missed out on a couple of features we could have delivered. Make it very tangible and you can start at any maturity level and make it a conversation. And it gives you a reason to change, right? Like I've seen a yes. lot of organizations pick a methodology and say, hey, we're gonna adopt, you know, whatever, scaled agile framework is, is probably the most popular in the industry right now. And a lot of people on the teams are scratching their heads saying, you know, why do I need to do this again? What's the point? By, by approaching it as, hey, we're, we're working on continuous improvement, model and we're making that our decisions about what we do based on data, it gives a compelling reason why. We're not just going through with the motions to do something. We're actually doing it to solve this specific problem. Let's brainstorm the best way to do and it. And that translates into money. Absolutely. Yep. You'll get support for money. <laughs> You're saving money and directing money that's going to bring better value. You have a much stronger conversation. This yep. puts technology teams on a much stronger footing than we've ever seen before because you have the data and you can use the data. Bet you if you use whack-a-mole, they'd pay more attention. <laughs> they'd hurt more. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. 
Excellent. Our next question, I think, ties into a little bit to that. It says, are we trying too hard to fit expectations from multiple stakeholders into the agile way of doing things? In your experience, does it make more sense to tailor the methodology to what the stakeholder expectations are versus trying to use the agile way or the highway? I'd like to all jump you. in. Take this all first. you, Margo. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I think that, I think that you have to look at the scope and the nature of a product to understand what approach you're going to take. I don't think anything, I don't think you should try to force anything in an organization where it doesn't make common sense to deliver it. If you have a product that's in place, you know, an application, a system in place that has been in place for a while, there's not a high level of change. There's not, um, you know, and, and your customers are, satisfied with it, there's no need to put that into an Agile or a Scrum framework. You would benefit, everybody can benefit from Agile techniques like stand-up meetings, um, having, you know, looking at things like retrospectives and some of those approaches, everybody can benefit from a level of automation. But if you want to, if you want to take a sequential approach or even better, take a Kanban approach, that allows you to have a sequential flow of steps, that's absolutely fine. It's what works for your organization. What's most important is identifying what are the important data points we need to know that the product is delivering value, what's the level of satisfaction, and you know, is that level of value that, that's being delivered being delivered in the direction that the company wants to go? And from there, then you can make, you can empower your teams to make the decision about what's the best way to deliver. You still get the benefit from applying certain agile techniques, but you could, you know, the whole thing is about adaptability. Mic drop. That was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, Thank you. that I was my first mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I mean, anything that's not contributing to my organizational goal is taking energy away from things that would contribute to my organizational goal. Whether that's, you know, changing your language, changing a process, doing doing this or that, it's got to contribute to the organizational goal. So I'm I'm a big fan of being pragmatic and solving problems. Great. And the next question is: In your experience with engaging with companies globally, what is the right balance uh, to managing shared resources within the company to what a vendor-driven project timeline entails? That is a good question. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any hard and fast rule for that. Um, I mean, can you apply? So I, I'm, I'm assuming the, the, the question is about commercially bought tools versus internally developed products. And, um, you know, I think that you, you may not, and, and guys jump in here. I think, you know, if you're looking at something that's a commercial product, you know, depending on the amount of configuration that you do to that product, you know, that may dictate the levels of quality and customer experience that you're going to have. So you would want to assign what the value is in creating these configurations. I mean, I've seen some SaaS products configured into the ground where it's unusable. So, you know, I think that from, from a high level um, output and goal perspective, the, the, the principles are not that different, but I think it's how you manage it. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, that might be a little bit different. Neil and I don't know. Danny, your thoughts? Yeah, I think I think it's pretty consistent. I think you're you're trying to evaluate: is this going to meet our needs in the kind of 90, 80, 90 percent level? I think this is how we make these decisions mm -hmm. ourselves as a company, or how I make them. And yeah. and if we can get there, that's great. But the simple reality now with APIs and all of this other stuff also is: what is you know, uh, you know, SolarWinds taught us, right? Like 80% of software is not built in-house. In right. <laughs> you know, I think a lot of us have known that, but it, that made it front and center. 
um, equally very rarely any longer are off the shelf tools, not just configured and then augmented and have you know UX layers that you're slapping Tableau on top of or whatever. So I, I don't even think it's a black and white question anymore. It tends to be these layers of gray um, in any scenario. Yeah, and, and I guess the other thing I've just seen in practice, right? Like where I was working with a company that was doing um, hardware development. So they're you know building devices. And so a lot of that was an outsourced vendor, which I think was maybe like, how does that vendor work different than internal? And, and while internally, like the big difference is we had some control over, you know, the, the communication cycles, tools they use, things like that. With the external vendor, we didn't have a lot of control over that. Like they're, they insisted on more of a classic waterfall stage gate way of working. And so while we knew that wasn't, you know, the likelihood if 18 months, they weren't gonna be able to do it because they're only integrating things together and testing them, you know, the, the final leg, we knew that would be a challenge. So we wanted to, to get insights into what they were doing as quickly as we could so we could test out the, the model and, and actually do an A-B test kind of comparison, working with them to say, hey, you know, we're all in this together, let's deliver it. So I think having a, a tool like Viz that can connect all these disparate tools together where you may not, you may not you know, be able to force them to use your JIRA, right? They may, they may decide they want to use some other tool. If, if we can still connect that into the same value stream ecosystem and get insights, it begins to help you actually coach to those uh, things before they become issues. So you can kind of deal with the risk before they become issues and mm -hmm. just start with insights. So that, that's kind of a, the big difference for me is how much I can, how much I can you know, maybe direct best practices um, versus how much I have to, to prove them out and, and then you know, fix stuff as we go. Regardless, you're responsible for delivering to a customer. So you have to have this view across however it is you are delivering to a customer. That's mm -hmm. the most important part here. Even if it's an internal customer, they still Even have it. Yes. But what's fascinating is most of the value streams that we end up working with, I would say 75% end up being for internal customers. And, mm -hmm. and, right? Because th there are that many more projects typically in a big bank, big insurance company, manufacturing plant that are more internal focused than, than necessarily yeah. external focused. Awesome. We are at the top of the hour. I'm going to sneak one more question in because I think there's a, a few people asked us kind of a similar question. So I'm going to morph it into one and then we'll wrap up. And that is, you know, what are the basics that are needed to be in place to build the data needed to measure the process? Or what would you say is the right level of detail needed for the value stream model to be an effective enabler for planning? I'll jump on this one real quick. I think it's just desire to want to improve. I think that's the most important thing. Um, and by definition, I think that means it has to be at a senior enough level that the organization will follow that. But it's this, it's this desire to get better because again, my description of whack-a-mole, it's, it's essentially talking about improving one or 2% every couple of weeks. You do that often enough, you get 30 and 40% improvements across a year. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, you can always get some insight from something. There's not like a, a floor, you know, you have to start with, but if, if, shoot, I've got, you know, a handful of teams using JIRA and they only have three columns on their storyboard, I can still get some insights from that as far as, you know, where are things bogging down on a particular team's uh, flow and then how does that compare to other teams around it? Where are the issues going to be? So even in a in a very simple rudimentary, you know, just right out of the box starting standpoint, there's insights you can get if you can get access to that data. Yeah, I would agree. Start start simple, ask questions, try to glean the the uh, minimum viable amount of decision making information you need. And then it will help, and, and those conversations will then drive where you need to go from there. I think you can't think you can spring this fully formed. You really need to build it and find out what works for you. 